What's going on, Junkie Nation? Gorgeous George and Goes are back with another superstar from the sport of mixed martial arts. This time we get to talk to your boy, Eric Anders, who's going to be facing off against Kyle Dacus at an upcoming UFC fight night. What's going on, Eric? How are you? Man, I'm doing awesome. And yourself? Good, thank you. We haven't chatted in a bit, so the first thing I wanted to start off with was uh, the move to fight ready. Um, how's that been for you the last few years? And... Tell me, I guess, where you feel like you benefited and, and made yourself a stronger uh, competitor. Um, I think all around, um, grappling, striking, like the in-between, the moving in and out. Um, probably range and distance the most. Uh, I think I have more volume, higher punch count, things like that. Strategy is better. Um, haven't really gotten the results uh, that I've wanted um, over the past four fights, but you know, I think that's more so me implementing the game plan and doing what I'm supposed to do rather more so than it is the actual training. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I know you've fluctuated from middleweight to light heavyweight. And I just wanted to go back in time again and ask you, what decides that? Is it just whether the UFC gives you enough time that you can do middleweight, you would um, um, or not? Or, man, you know, to be honest, I think that. Uh, they were really short on light heavyweights at one point. So, you know, me, Chiago Santos, Anthony Smith, um, a few of those guys made that jump up in weight class just because it wasn't as crowded as the middleweight division. Um, but I just, you know, I don't know. I prefer middleweight, you know. Um, I feel like I have to be more, like, in tune. I have to – I don't have, like, days off. I have to like constantly like think about what I'm eating and what I'm doing and stuff. More cardio. So I think like from a preparation standpoint, I just feel better at 85, you know, 205, you know, not saying I do, but, you know, I could just show up and, and fight, you know, cut a little bit of weight the day before. And, you know, I, I just don't feel as like sharp, you know? Mm -hmm. We always talk about when we talk to fighters that, that have moved around in weight class, the benefits, you know, or um, the non-benefits to doing that. And I haven't talked to this, I haven't talked about this in a while, but Diego Sanchez told us over a decade ago, you know, he can do all of these different weight classes. I mean, I think he even fought at 45 once, but this is when he was going back between 70 and 55. He said at 55, I felt great, just like you described. Everything had to be on point, but I felt great. However, he did notice that he was a little bit more susceptible to injury. Is that the same for you? That's 20 pounds. You know, like, have you ever felt the same or or maybe that was just isolated for him? Um, yeah, maybe isolated for him, maybe the way he was doing it. And maybe that is common, but I don't feel more injuries. You know, uh, I don't feel more tired. I don't feel much of anything, just a little more hunger, you know. Um <laughs> So, yeah, like, I don't think it's a big deal. I know a lot of dudes, like, do get hurt, uh, you know, trying to cut a bunch of weight. And, um, you know, they get knocked out a little bit easier. You know, they're, they're like, more susceptible to, you know, getting knocked out and stuff. And I don't think I've ever even been, you know, dropped at 205. You know, I've taken the most dam or excuse me, at middleweight, the most damage I've taken was at 205 when I was, you know, healthier or whatever. But. Um, man, to be honest, uh, I'm, I'm just a fat kid in between, uh, in between fights. And that's why I have to cut so much weight. If I didn't eat like a child when I'm not fighting, you know, I wouldn't have so much weight to cut and I'd probably be like a regular sized, uh, middleweight, but you know, I like the candy and the sweets and the beer and pizza and stuff. So yeah, I kind of make it hard on myself, you know, mm -hmm. trust me, we know we're on that same, uh, we got that same issue. Um, I wanted to ask you about this particular matchup here. Was there anything that stood out when, when you heard the name? Uh, anything about the, the fight in particular that stood out over other fights that you're excited about? Um, man, you know, they really don't offer me like two or three fights at a time. They're like, hey, you want to fight this guy on this day? Okay, cool. So it's not like I picked Kyle Dawkins out of like other fighters or whatever, but you know, I, everybody knows, like it's no secret, like his strong suit is grappling. You know, I think he's got 11 wins and nine of them will come from like a Doris or an arm bar, like some kind of submission. So that's his game, you know, on his way to the submission. Like he's a scrambly guy, you know, going to try and get it to the ground, I think. And uh, 
I think if you engage in like the jujitsu with him, like he gets really scrambly and you know, he's a submission over position kind of guy. So, you know, it's a, you know, obviously a super dangerous fight, you know, I think when guys are like specialists at one particular thing, you know, uh, he's got a lot of wins by that way, and everybody knows what's going on, kind of like an Andre Muniz, but, you know, they still find ways to, to catch guys with it. So, you know, I knew Muniz was going to try and armbar me, and he did. So and I think between him and I, it's like whoever implements their game plan and, you know, does what they're best at better um, is going to win this fight. Eric, do you like fighting in this time period? Because a win here kind of ends the year on a good note. And some people even say it kind of resets for next year, right? And and everything's a clean slate. And from there, uh, you, you could push through 2023. Um, you know, I think you're only as good as your last performance. And uh, so, you know, if this was, if this was March or this was, you know, October or December, I, you know, I really don't think what matter, it matters when you fight. Um, but like I said, you're only as good as your last performance. So, you know, just because you're going into the new year, I'll still be on the same contract. So, um, yeah, that like the time of year doesn't really matter for me. You know, um, the only thing that matters for me is like the weather. Like, obviously, it'd be easier to cut weight if it was, you know, 120 degrees outside out here in uh, Arizona. You know, like, you know, you would like lose more weight per workout or whatever. So, you know, outside of that, like, I really don't really don't care like what time of year, you know. When we bring up Eric Anders, we don't always have to talk about fighting. You've done other things in life here. One cool thing that George and I experienced was just watching you on TV, man. It was so cool to see you pop up in that series. Uh, how did all that come about? Did you enjoy it? Is it something that's going to keep going? Yeah, I would love for it to keep going. I think it'd be a nice way to, to make a living, you know, outside, you know, when fighting is over with, you know. Um, and I really got the opportunity because they filmed the movie called Embattled uh, out there in Birmingham where I live. And uh, the guys came to the gym and, you know, used the gym to do stunts and like, practice their stuff and whatnot. And, um, <clears throat> you know, just, you know, being around people like you talk to them or whatever, get to know them. And, you know, the stunt coordinator, Don Lee, um, let a bunch of people, a bunch of the fighters from the gym, like be extras in the movie. And then he became the stunt director for Cobra Kai. And, uh, you know, they said they needed a big Mexican looking fella. So, you know, I kind of fit the bill. So they let me do that. And yeah, hopefully it leads to, you know, more opportunities. And of course, your first love is always, well, yeah, your first love was football, to be fair. I don't know if you fell more in love with mixed martial arts down the yeah. road or what. But, um, what about football like how how much do you keep tabs on it you know the crimson tide obviously um has this in any way made you stand out from other former athletes that have played for nick saban where you know maybe one day you could be on a sideline you know being a defensive coordinator eventually a head coach or anything like that Nah, man, my football days are over with, man. You know, I just uh, watch my watch my sons play football, watch it on. It's like background noise for me. You know, I just uh, turn it on Saturday or Sunday just to, you know, you know, while I read a book or, you know, do stuff around the house, clean up the house or, you know, fold laundry or whatever. I'm doing about, you know, I rarely ever just like sit down and watch um, like a full game. I may watch a quarter here or half of it there or whatever but you know I, I just got so much stuff going on that you know for me to just like sit down in front of a tv for four hours is it's not possible how convenient eric uh, eric anders because when we first met you <laughs> man you didn't miss a crimson tide game and our usc trojans were struggling but now that we're top five and you guys are like with two losses hanging down <laughs> the season ain't over background with, noise huh all right you know the season's not over with you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens, man. Ohio State had a little bit of a scare yeah. the other day. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility for some of these, uh, you know, other schools to lose a game or two, and Alabama's right back in there. So, you know, yeah. we'll see what happens. Don't don't you think? Uh, do, do you wish the? Do you think you would have benefited from nil um, name image likeness for those that don't know? 
that the athletes are now getting, you know, I, I'm sure you would have benefited in the sense that a lot of teams have like where all the athletes are sharing or, or something like that. But what would the difference have made, you know, in terms of like players that can now make some money while they play versus the ones that are literally starving, you know, like they, they, they don't maybe have enough to splurge on the weekend. And, and, you know, we always hear about the cup of noodles. A lot, a lot of athletes will say, man, sometimes it's a couple of noodles that week, but yeah. can you talk a little bit about the differences when you played in, and now? Um, yeah. You know, I think the NIL thing along with the transfer portal is like slowly, but surely like killing college football. Um, because, you know, the transfer portal lets you transfer without penalty. And when I was playing, like, you had to sit out a year so it made kids, you know, um, buckle down and, and figure out what it is that they're doing wrong rather than now. Like, if, if the coach yells at them, you know, they just bounce to another school. You know, like, there's no discipline now. Like, and you can look at, like, the way they're catching the ball, the way they're tackling, the number of penalties. Um, and spe talking specifically about Alabama, who in the past and traditionally has always been one of the more disciplined teams, the least penalized teams in the league, in the in the, in, in the NCAA. But now they've had like two or three games where they've had 17 plus penalties. Like how, you know, it's really hard to win a game when you have, you know, 200 yards in penalties, you know, that's that's two touchdowns, you know and uh or at least field goals and uh so that they're literally giving the other team points uh with penalties uh if you understand what i'm saying and um and also you know like they're they these, some of these kids are paid now like the whole point of going to college was to make it to the nfl so you could get the money so you could buy your mom a new house a new car you know all those things but you know some of these kids are, are millionaires um, at 18, 19, 20 years old, you know, the motivation is gone, the financial motivation. Maybe they still want the status of being an NFL player, but, you know, who cares? You know, if you got money in your pocket, you know, it's like maybe someone can help you manage that money to make it make money or whatever, you know. So um, I just think that these kids, like they, uh, they're not nearly as tough as they used to be. You know what I mean? Like I think the coaches can't talk to them how they used to talk. Uh, talk to them. They can't, you know, enforce uh, rules and penalties like they used to because, you know, these kids, they, you know, they're kind of soft. So if you yell at them or make them sit out a game or suspend them or whatever the case may be, you know, they just pack their stuff and go to the next school. And so um, just look at the way they tackle. Just look at the the number of penalties, look at how the receivers go after balls. Like they're not diving, they're not running through traffic. They're not necessarily motivated to be that, that top 10 draft pick anymore. You know what I mean? Like when I played every, every play, like, you know, someone was trying to, to make it to the NFL, you know what I mean? So they didn't take plays off. There weren't a whole lot of penalties and people were making tackles, you know? So uh, I think it kind of, and also like the, a lot of people say they like college football because the NFL players, they're already paid, so they're playing not to get hurt and this, that, and the third. And I think it's starting to trickle down to the NCAA now. Yeah, I did see a lot of players in the last 10 years, five years maybe, skipping bowl games. Um, and you're right, taking, you know, shutting it down for the season because a lot of them do fall in love with the fact that they think that they are going to make it to the pros. But the pros is a whole other level. You know, and, and nothing's yeah. guaranteed just because you're an All-American in college. It just may not work out in the pros. But, wow, interesting perspective. You know, I'm going to start watching that. The hustle, the tackling, you know, the um, yeah. all the intangibles, you know, of uh, what makes a player great, and, you know. You know, that's just me, like, watching football. Like, I just don't watch, like, every team, you know what I mean? So, I, I'm not sure if that's like across the entire landscape of college football, but you know, to see Alabama go from like one of the least penalized teams to I don't know if they're one of the most penalized teams, but certainly more than the year before. I'm sure that has to have an effect across all of college football. Mm -hmm. Bryce Young, the Heisman winner, the current starter for Alabama, went to the high school I went to. And on the one hand, I'm happy for him when I see him in the Dr. Pepper commercials. 
uh, you know, in the Heisman house that they have. But as you were talking, I'm thinking, man, what if, what if making that commercial was one less session with your coach, you know, yeah. preparation yeah, or, or whatever. And, and could it have made the difference? I'm not coming at Bryce cause I could never prove that. I love Bryce watched him play and done a lot of great things for our school, but it got me thinking, you know, cause the same thing happens in this sport, MMA, uh, when you start to taste some of that money and popularity and fame, do you work as hard? You know, the whole silk sheet, silk pajamas that, that Marvin Hagler used to talk about and you have to get up when it's, 30 degrees and run five miles, you know, are you going to do it? Are you just going to, you know, get back in bed and say, yeah. man, jam, man, you know? Yeah, exactly. You know, you're, uh, and then, you know, think about man, this kid's 18 years old, 19, you know, Bryce Young, maybe 21 max, you know what I mean? So man, just think about, you know, some of the decisions you made and, and stuff that you were doing at 21, you know, you're probably not anywhere near, as like mentally mature then as you are now. Now you take like a, and I'm not saying like Bryce Young is immature. I'm not saying that, but right. compared to how he's going to be when he's 40, for sure he's immature. Got to be, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I think about just giving that kid, you know, I don't know how much he made. I'm sure he made quite a bit off of Dr. Pepper and the high school oh, yeah. stuff on top of the other stuff that he's getting. So like, I think it's just like human nature. It's like, okay. I'm not struggling anymore. I'm not starving anymore. I got it. I'm good. You know, they work a little bit less, you know. Nick Saban did an interview where he said Bryce Young was going to make seven figures playing college football at Alabama. That's crazy. That's, you know, a millionaire yeah. already as a freshman, sophomore. That's crazy. what I'm saying. Um, well, one last question here. Uh, I guess when I think of fight ready, I think of Henry Cejudo, who's competing again, right? But I yeah. also see him in a lot of corners. A lot of people say this guy's strategic or whatever, uh, good game planner. Um, would would you say? I guess is he the closest to a Nick Saban in MMA that you've experienced? Or do you work a lot with him directly? I see him, you know, some in, on your gram a little bit. But uh, what 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 would you say to that? Um, no, I wouldn't necessarily say that, that he's Nick Saban because it's, it's hard to be when you're working on yourself and putting together your own game plan for your own fight. It's hard to like sit back and look at and coach yeah. and look at other people's opponents and put together game plans for them and, and this, that, and the third. What I will say is like his mental preparation and, um, I don't know if game plan is the, is the, is the right word, but like the way that he approaches the game from a mental standpoint, I think anybody and everybody should benefit from like uh, just the stuff he says, not necessarily the strategy, but the way he goes about and implements the, the, you know, particular strategy or game plan or whatever um, is different than everybody else. I think so. I think that's what made him like a great, you know, a gold medalist. I think, you know, that's made him a, two division champ, you know? So um, I just think that like he operates a little bit differently on a mental capacity um, when it comes to MMA and, and combat sports in general. Like he just, one, he can he, he can just do it, you know? Uh, I've heard Santino and Eddie say like, he's the only guy that they can not even show him, just tell him what they want him to do and he can do it like the very next rep, you know? So he very, he is like a special kind of athlete, and it, I think the like, I, know, I think the athletes of his caliber have time being good coaches because they can't articulate what it is that they're doing. You understand? Like they can just do a lot of athletes. They can just do it. They just can. It's just that easy for them. So they have a hard time like understanding, but like, at why why can't you do that? Like you know what I mean? Why can't yeah. you do this? Why can't you do that? But I think that he does a good job of understanding that he's not like everybody else and you know um you know just helps people get ready in different ways you know well you paid him wonderful compliments but now that i think about it it's probably good that we stop sh short of comparing him to nick saban imagine that headline and then sahudo's head would get even bigger yeah sure. at the end of it <laughs> he, he is a good coach though you know i would say uh I don't know. He does have some like technical like coaching ability. Like he can, you know, you've seen a lot of people come out here. Like Yuri's been out here, Willie Lee's been out here. 
John Jones came out here. Um, a lot of people, a lot, a lot had of nice things yeah. to say about him too. Yeah, you know, a lot of champions are, and and you know, former champions and new champions uh, have been out here. So, you know, he's doing something. They like what he's doing, what he has to say, or his his tactics and preparation and things like that. So, you know, I think like once you've been, there's a lot of a plethora of experience that comes with being at the top. You know, he's been at the top in two different divisions and in a whole different sport. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of hard to not take what he says um, and apply it to your own game. Correct. Yeah. All right. It all goes down December 3rd in Orlando. Kyle Dacus and our guest here, Eric Anders, will be mixing it up. And we definitely look forward to that fight night. And Eric, as always, it's great chatting with you. Thank you so much for the time. Whatever's left of your training camp. May it be safe, along with the weight cuts and the travel to Orlando, and I hope you have a spectacular fight on uh, on the third. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you.